Okay, we are discussing uh, homogeneous but anisotropic space-time models, at least that's the goal. What we have done to begin with was we were talking about the Bianchi classification, which is a purely mathematical subject. What is classified is just the set of all three-dimensional real Lie algebras. And we have seen that there are nine types. This was a traditional uh, numer um, uh, yeah, numbering uh, chosen by, by Bianchi. Today we do it in a little bit different way. That's the reason why it looks a little bit funny. So that the six and the seven depends on the parameter. And the six with a parameter equal to minus one is actually equal to the three. So the three is actually superfluous. But uh, that's how it, how it came about uh, historically. And uh, what we classified was actually the geometric structure of this, uh, mm -hmm. the geometric, uh, sorry, the algebraic, uh, the algebraic properties of the structure constants. So the structure constants were defined in the following way. I choose the basis in my, uh, in my Lie algebra, and then I write the Lie bracket, which must be, again, a linear combination of the basis vector because it is uh, inside the, the Lie algebra. So we have a, a Lie algebra, which means that the bracket of two basis vectors is, again, a linear combination of the, uh, of the basis vectors. And the coefficients, which appear here, we call it uh, CLIJ. These are so-called structure constants. And what we classified was just the possible algebraic, uh, 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 the, the algebraic possibilities for these structure constants. And the simplest type was Bianchi 1, and that's what we want to discuss in more detail today. Bianchi 1 was a case that CLIJ is just 0. So that's the Abelian Lie algebra. Yeah? So all the brackets between the, uh, between the elements of the, of the Lie algebra vanish. That's, of course, the easiest thing you can, um, you can consider. And now we want to do cosmology with this, with this structure. So the idea is that we want to construct cosmological models which are more general, less symmetrical than the Robertson-Walker universes. So we still have a slicing into hypersurfaces t equal constant, but the hypersurfaces are no longer isotropic and homogeneous. They are only homogeneous. And if I have such a Lie algebra, in particular the Bianchi-1 Lie algebra, then I can look for space times. I could try to find space times where this Lie algebra, this Bianchi 1 Lie algebra, just generates these surfaces. So, my base, so the a realization of this Lie algebra in terms of killing vector fields should have the property that they span, there are three actually, three of them. So, let me write it this way K1, K2. And K3, you have to, <laughs> have to uh, 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 keep in your head. And again, here, K1, K2, and K3. So they are supposed to span these three-dimensional hypersurfaces. And because they are three, three basis vectors, three linearly independent basis vectors, and these surfaces are also three-dimensional, they must be linearly independent. Yeah? Otherwise, it doesn't work. So the representation in terms of killing vectors must, must be such that they actually span the tangent space to this, to this hypersurface. And now Bianchi 1 is very particular. Bianchi 1 is particular because in this case, the commutator of the killing vector fields vanishes. It's only for Bianchi 1, this, uh, uh, this case. And this, uh, this is what we, what we want to, to employ now. So for Bianchi 1, we can, because of Ki Kj equals zero, we can choose our coordinates, three-dimensional coordinates in these hypersurfaces such that the killing vector fields are these basis vector fields. So we may choose them such that this is d by dx1, this is d by dx2, and this is d by dx2. Yeah? Recall, if we have just one killing vector field and it has no zeros, then we can write around the point where it has no zeros. We can always write it as a coordinate vector field. 
But now we want to write three killing vector fields, three linearly independent killing vector fields in one and the same coordinate system such that all of them are coordinate vector fields. And that's a highly non-trivial uh, non assumption. And obviously, is it necessary for this that the Lie bracket vanishes because the Lie bracket of two basis vector fields always vanishes. Yeah, partial derivatives commute. And this applied to a scalar function is just a, just a partial derivative in coordinates. So this only works for Bianchi 1. That we can use the killing, that we can choose the killing vector in, in such a way that they coincide with our three spatial coordinate, uh, coordinate lines. And uh, yeah, uh, then of course, uh, because uh, we, have, um, we have these different hypersurfaces, so we can uh, make them, uh, we could, could make the, the case perpendicular on one hypersurface because we are free to make bases. Uh, uh, to change the basis with, with, a constant, with, uh, with a constant linear transformation, right? So if somebody has chosen a basis, I can choose another basis just by applying a linear transformation, linear with constant coefficients, and uh, I, can, I could use this in order to, to make these, uh, these things pairwise perpendicular. So choose basis such that that um, the metric, our space-time metric, that uh, this is, uh, is zero for i different from j. We can certainly do this in one hypersurface. The question is, does it work? Is it possible to choose this in a way that it works on each hypersurface? So if we have chosen our basis in such a way that on one hypersurface they are orthogonal, and now we have here, we could choose proper time in the, on, the, uh, on the lines perpendicular to this, as we did in the Robertson-Walker case. And we have here a vector field d by dt. And now the question is, if I propagate my killing vector fields uh, in, in time, do they remain perpendicular? And it's not obvious that this works. And actually, uh, uh, in general, if we, if we deal with a more general situation, then it does not work. But in the case we are interested in, actually it does work. So what we do is we just assume that it works, we make an ansatz, and then we see that this is really consistent when we solve the field equation for where we will first do vacuum and then we will do a dust. And we'll see that the equations are consistent. But this is not guaranteed from the outset. Actually, you would have to, to be uh, aware with the possibility that this doesn't work. That if you have chosen them orthogonal on one hypersurface, that they cannot be orthogonal on another hypersurface. So, uh, but, but what is clear from, from homogeneity is that, um, that from homogeneity it is clear that uh, G dt dt, that this is constant on each, on each hypersurface. So if I differentiate this in a spatial direction, in a direction tangential to the uh, to, the, to the hypersurface, that then it remains constant. This follows from homogeneity. We want to have homogeneous uh, hypersurfaces, not isotropic, but homogeneous ones. And if this quantity, if this thing here, would be different uh, on, at, at different points here, then uh, it would distinguish different points from each other. So this is certainly possible. And what is also possible is that we choose this perpendicular and um, uh, and, uh, and we may choose coordinates such that G, actually I should have written this first because it's more, uh, more basic than the other property, that this works. So what I do is just, I choose for my T lines, the lines which are perpendicular to my slices, and then this is satisfied, yeah? And that's, uh, so because this is a constant here, I can normalize it now to, to minus one or minus C squared, and then it really means that the vector field dt, uh, yeah, the flow of this, of this vector field takes these hypersurfaces into each other, and that they are just labeled by the proper time along this time-like curve. So taking all this together, then the metric reads like what? And that's an uh, ansatz for a Bianchi for a Bianchi one, space-time. So we have minus c squared 
dt squared because d by dt is normalized. Yeah? It has a constant length, and if we scale it appropriately, we have just a familiar factor minus c squared here. This means that on the t lines, uh, the t coordinate is really proper time. And then we have, because the space, uh, there are no mixed terms because of this, yeah, we have chosen the t lines perpendicular to the slices. And then we have something dx, uh, well, I have written dx1. Let's stick to this. dx1. No, there's no gap. Here's a gap. Plus dx2 squared. Oops. Plus dx3 squared. And, uh, well, I could normalize also the spatial uh, basis vectors, my basis for the killing vector fields at one point, but this, of course, will not be preserved by the flow of T. So the length of these things, they will change, of course, uh, just as in the Robertson-Walker space-time, uh, we have the scale factor, uh, the scales, uh, yeah, the scale factor which, which changes all length. So we have to be aware of the fact that here the coefficients will depend on T. Yeah, we cannot get, get rid of this by, by a coordinate transformation. And uh, actually, this will be f the factors in general will be different for the for the three terms. So I have here, uh, let's say, uh, let's say a capital X. Or let me write instead of x1, x2, x3. Let me write x, y, and z. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, yeah. I think this is uh, uh, it spares me a lot of indices. Um, actually, with x1 is x x2 is y, and x3 is z. Then I don't have, I have to write these, uh, these stupid indices all the time. So then this is dx, this is dy, and this is dz. That's better. And the coefficients I then call capital X, and this will depend on t. So it's a scale factor, but only in the x direction. And here I will have a different scale factor, a y of t, and here the z of t. So you see, if the capital X, Y, and Z are equal, then this is just the Robertson-Walker space-time. Yeah? And it is a spatially flat Robertson-Walker space-time. So the spatially flat Robertson-Walker space-times are special cases of Bianchi-1 space-times. The other Robertson-Walker space-times not. The one with positive or negative uh, curvature, they are not special cases of Bianchi-1. They are special cases of other Bianchi, uh, Bianchi cases, but not of Bianchi-1. And uh, yeah, the new feature is that uh, in, in, in the three different spatial directions, I can have different scale factors. And you would expect that this could change the character of the singularity considerably, and actually it will. Yeah? If we have this isotropic ansatz for the Robertson-Walker space-time, then it's clear if it collapses, if the volume collapses to zero, if we go into the path, then it must be isotropically, yeah? because all the, all the directions have equal right. But here, some directions could collapse, and maybe the other directions could do something different. And the question is, maybe we could even avoid uh, uh, an initial singularity with this more general ansatz. Actually, we will see that, for instance, for a dust solution, we still have a singularity, but a singularity of a different kind, an anisotropic singularity. So our goal is now to solve this for, uh, we will first do it for vacuum, as we did in the, uh, in the uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic case. We first considered vacuum. And the motivation is, is here exactly the same as it was for the Robertson-Walker case. The motivation is that the vacuum case occurs as a limit, as an interesting limit. Uh, we are not interested in vacuum solutions if we do cosmology, but the vacuum solutions uh, play a certain role in a, in a limit. So we will see that the dust solution of this, uh, with this ansatz that they approach vacuum solutions under certain conditions if we approach the singularity. So near the singularity, the vacuum solutions are actually, uh, are actually not so bad. OK, so what do we have to do now? Uh, may, uh, maybe I, for, I forgot to say one thing. So I said we want to do homogeneous cosmology. And then we can do this with this Bianchi ansatz. So the Bianchi ansatz is that we have a three-dimensional Lie algebra that this is realized in terms of killing vector fields, and that this three-dimensional algebra of killing vector fields spans hypersurfaces. This is not the only way in which you can produce homogeneity. You might have a four-dimensional Lie algebra, which also spans these three-dimensional hypersurfaces. And uh, that, that this would be the case if our four killing vector fields, which span the Lie algebra, are linearly dependent at each point. Yeah? So that they span only something three-dimensional. 
And it may very well be, and it is actually the case, that some of these four-dimensional Lie algebras do not have a three-dimensional subalgebra. So the Bianchi models are not the most general class of spatially homogeneous models. They are the ones which are really generated by three-dimensional Lie algebra. There's another class which is generated by four-dimensional Lie algebras. They are locally rotationally symmetric spaces. That's how they are called, LRS spaces, but I will not deal with them. You could ask, what about five-dimensional Lie algebras? You can prove that it doesn't work with five dimensions. Yeah? So you cannot have a five-dimensional Lie algebra which spans three-dimensional slices. That's impossible. But you can, again, have six-dimensional. And you all know this. This is Robertson Walker. Yeah? Robertson Walker, of course, they are, all spa are also spatially hyper uh, homogeneous. So uh, Robertson Walker spaces are uh, particular examples for spatially homogeneous uh, universes. They have additional properties. So uh, yeah, so they are, uh, they are, but they are actually special cases of Bianchi models. So the Robertson Walker spaces are contained in the Bianchi model. So they always have a three-dimensional subalgebra, but the four-dimensional have not. So one would have to uh, treat them differently. Maybe some of you have heard about kantowski sachs model. kantowski sachs is such a, such a model with a four-dimensional Lie algebra, the, the most famous one. But I will not do this here. So what I wanted to say is just when you restrict to the Bianchi models, uh, this is not uh, the most general way of treating homogeneous cosmology. And of course, when we restrict to Bianchi 1, that's what we do now. This is even more special. But it is interesting. It gives interesting results. So what we will do now, so we want to solve Einstein's field equation. And, and we will do this first for vacuum. So what we have to calculate is, of course, uh, is the Ricci tensor. Yeah? Vacuum field equation without cosmological constants means Ricci equals zero. Field equation for vacuum with lambda equals zero. That's our first goal. So we want to solve the Einstein's field equation with lambda equals zero, vacuum with this metric ansatz, with this Bianchi one metric ansatz. So we have to calculate the Ricci tensor. And of course, uh, we don't do this by hand. And I will certainly not do it on the board. So I just will write down what the Ricci tensor is. So I have done the calculation with, with Mathematica. And I just uh, write it out now what we get. So with this metric ansatz, actually, this is uh, it's a fairly, fairly harmless uh, form of a metric. So one could do it by hand uh, uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. But uh, why should one do this if one has Mathematica? So um, with the abbreviations, so we introduce a few ab abbreviations. All of them are functions of t. This is x prime of t over x of t, e of t is y prime of t over y of t, and uh, c of t, surprise, is z prime of t over z of t. And then one also introduces theta of t, which is a sum of a, b, and c, plus b of t plus c of t. And with these abbreviations, the uh, components of the Ricci tensor look uh, don't look too difficult. So I have an RTT. Yeah, my coordinates are t, x, y, and z. And actually, the uh, Ricci tensor will come out diagonal. So we have only diagonal elements. So this is minus theta prime. This theta derivative with respect to t minus a squared minus b squared minus c squared. Everything is a function of t, but I don't write this. It's not a function of the axis, because we are in a homogeneous space time. Yeah? It's a function only on, uh, only on t. And uh, yeah, the x, y, and the z directions are different. But we don't have a dependence on the coordinates x, y, z, because we still have homogeneity. And then rxx. rxx is x squared over velocity of light squared, c squared, a prime plus theta a. And well, analogously for the y and z coordinates, uh, y, y is the same thing with y. So here I have b prime plus theta b, and rz, z 
is z squared over c squared c prime plus theta c. That's it. And uh, r mu nu is zero from mu different from mu. Oops. Yeah, so the off diagonal elements are all zero. So what we want to solve is a field equation. So the field equation, ah, I should also write the, the curvature scalar. So from this, this expressions we find the, the curvature scalar. That's now easy to calculate. Yeah, this, this matrix, uh, this, uh, yeah, this matrix G mu nu, which is written here in this, uh, in this uh, line, uh, can easily be inverted, right? Because it's diagonal. So the things with uh, the G with the upper indices just have the inverse of these terms in the diagonal. So you can very easily calculate the Ricci scalar from this. And what you get is the following. It's 2 over C squared theta prime plus a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus a b plus b c plus c a. That's it. So the field equation now, we are considering the vacuum field equation with lambda equals 0. So this is just r mu nu equals 0. Yeah, we have to equate r mu nu to 0. Then we get a differential equation for the x, the y, and the z. Yeah? They, are, they are hidden inside the a, b, c, and the theta. So our three dependent variables are capital X, capital Y, capital T. And we get a set of ordinary differential equations for this. Ordinary differential equations. Yeah, in general, Einstein's field equation is a set of partial differential equations, if I write it out in coordinates. But if you have homogeneity, the metric coefficients depend only on one variable, t. So only derivatives with respect to t will occur. So we get a set of ordinary differential equations. That's a very important uh, advantage of uh, uh, this homogeneity ansatz, that it reduces Einstein's field equation to a set of ordinary differential equations. So you can treat it uh, yeah, with the methods uh, yeah, one, one learns in, in classical mechanics. Yeah? In classical mechanics, we have differential equations um, uh, which may be coupled, but which are ordinary. Yeah? Uh, 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 equations for the, world li for, the, yeah, for the world lines or for the paths of particles. So they have components and they depend only on t. We have exactly the same kind of mathematics here. And we can use the same, the same techniques. So for some Bianchi models, for instance, you can, you can introduce a Hamiltonian formalism. You can use Hamiltonian mechanics just in the way as you are used it uh, from classical mechanics in order to study the dynamics. But what we do here, the vacuum uh, Bianchi 1 solutions, uh, they don't require such sophisticated techniques. We can just solve these equations easily by hand. So we consider first the equation, a certain combination of the, uh, of the Ricci tensor, namely the RTT component, which is zero, plus C squared half the Ricci scalar, which is zero. Yeah, because all components of the Ricci tensor are zero, then of course also the Ricci scalar is zero. So this is zero by the field equation. This is zero by the field equation, so we must have this zero. And now let's see what we get. I just insert these expressions. So RTT is minus theta prime minus a squared minus b squared minus c squared. And if you multiply this with c squared half, then I have just the expression inside the bracket. So I have plus theta prime plus a squared plus b squared plus c squared, and then these three terms, plus ab, plus bc, plus ca. That's it. Right, you see, a lot of terms go away. This cancels with this, this cancels with this, this with this, and this with this. So only the, these three terms remain. But this implies that 
theta squared is the following. What was theta? Theta was a plus b plus c. So this is a plus b plus c squared. Now if I calculate this just, uh, just uh, uh, stubbornly, then I get a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus 2ab plus 2bc plus 2ca. But we have just calculated that the last three terms give a zero. Yeah? AB plus BC plus CA must be zero. So this here is zero. So we have found that A squared plus B squared plus C squared must be theta squared. But now we have again RTT equals zero. We look again. A squared plus B squared plus C squared is uh, minus theta prime. Yeah? And this gives a nice and simple differential equation for theta. So I think we can manage to solve this differential equation. <laughs> so there are two cases, actually. The first case we have to consider is that theta is equal to 0. Yeah? Because if I want to solve this by separation of variables, I have to divide by theta squared. But for that, I have to assume that theta is not 0, because otherwise I couldn't divide by theta. So we have two cases. First case, oops. Theta equals 0. What does this mean? Well, theta equals 0, from this line you see, it means a squared plus b squared plus c squared is equal to 0. This implies a squared plus b squared plus c squared is 0. And of course, a, b, c are real. So if you square a real quantity, you cannot get something negative. So each three terms separately must be 0. Yeah, that's the only possibility. So we must have a equal b equal c equal 0. But what was A, what was B, what was C? It was this here. A equals 0 means x prime equals 0. B equals 0 means one y prime equals 0. And C equals 0 means z prime equals 0. So this implies x prime is y prime is z prime equals 0. This means x, y, and z are constant. Now look at the metric. If x, y, and z are constant, what is this? What is this is if x, y, and z are constant? And all the metric coefficients are constants. This must be Minkowski space. Yeah? You can just rescale the coordinates then. If this is a constant, you can say capital X time little x is your new x, yeah, your x tilde or whatever. And then it's Minkowski in standard coordinates. So this gives you Minkowski space time. So this gives the Minkowski space, uh, the Minkowski metric. That's nice. Of course, the Minkowski metric is a Bianchi universe, but it's not what we are interested in. We want to do cosmology. We don't want to study flat space. So this case is uninteresting for us. So the second case is the one we want to study further. So the second case is that theta is not zero. And then we can divide by theta. And our differential equation then reads minus d theta by dt. Uh, I can divide by theta squared. This is 1, right? That's our differential equation. And this means it's the same as, well, the variables are already separated is theta by theta squared is 1 over, uh, it's nonsense, dt. It's just dt. OK, and that can easily be integrated. So this is, on the left-hand side, this is ln theta. Uh, no, sorry, nonsense, nonsense. It's 1 over theta. There's a square. Yeah, It's 1 over theta. If I differentiate this, I get minus 1 over theta squared. That's what I have on the left-hand side. And here I have t plus an integration constant. And uh, yeah, this is irrelevant, so we set the constant equal to zero. Yeah, we are always free, as we were in the Robertson-Walker spaces, to, to shift our t-coordinate by a constant up or, up or down. 
So I, I choose this integration constant equal to, uh, equal to zero. So then we have theta of t is one over t, okay? And now, oops, we can solve our differential equations for a, b, and c. And for that, we need the other three components. We haven't used the other three components. Until now, we have only used the TT component, where we have used the other three components because they enter into the Ricci scalar. Yeah? But only the combination which enters into the Ricci scalar has been used, not the three components individually. So let's begin with Rxx equals zero. So um, then zero is Rxx. And Rxx, uh, yeah, I divide by, well, of course, the capital X, the capital Y, the capital Z, they are not allowed to be zero, right? Because then the metric would, uh, would collapse. So I can safely divide by this. So this implies, this implies that A prime plus theta A is zero. Plus theta A is zero. Oops. So again, we can easily separate the variables. This a prime is just a shorthand for the a by dt. Theta is one over a. Or let me put it to the other side. And I have minus. It's one over t, not one over a. One over t times a. So this is dA over a. And if I multiply this to the other side, it's minus dt over t equal equal to this. Oops. Okay, and now comes the log. I was jumping ahead a bit. Now comes the log. Ln A is minus Ln T. Well, and uh, here I will, uh, um, in uh, yeah, I have to allow the, the integration constant. I cannot set it uh, equal to zero uh, generically because, uh, yeah, I have, on I, have already, I have already shifted my T coordinate uh, to kill one of the integration constant. Yeah, I cannot do it another time because now I've, I've fixed the zero for the t-coordinate. So here really we have a, a constant and let me call it ln of p. p is a constant. Well, if I, yeah, I can give any name to the integration constant, I call it ln p, because then I can exponentiate the expression easily. So I get a of t is uh, p over t, right? That's it. But this means that x prime over x, which is a, is p over t, yeah? So actually my final goal is to determine the x, the y, and the z. And uh, the a was just x prime over x, so I have to integrate this. That's also not too difficult. So this gives, uh, yeah, let me write it out, dx by dx is p uh, dt, 1d is enough, over t, is that right? Yes, a, a p was there, a p was there. This means ln x, ln x is uh, p ln t, and again an integration constant, which I uh, cannot uh, fix, um, uh, uh, um, where I have no freedom to, to fix it. So let's see. Uh, in order to uh, get something which is dimensionally reasonable, I should add or subtract an integration constant which has the same dimensions as these things. So it should be this, uh, the same p, which is a constant, and then ln of a time, yeah, where, the, where this time is now the integration constant. So let me write p ln to, where to is uh, the integration constant with the dimension of a time. And yeah, maybe I can squeeze this here in, the, in this line. So my result is x of t is, yeah, what is it? t to the, t over t o, t over t o to the p. That's my solution for the function x. And now you see it's quite analogous for the other components because, uh, yeah, the x, the y, and the z components, they look exactly the same. So they have the same structure. So I get the same result for the y and the z, the analogous result. So analogously I get, oops, analogously 
I get, uh, well, for the y component, there's a coefficient was called b. We had here a is p over t. So we have now b, yeah, some other integration constant, q over t. And the y is then has the same structure as this here, t over t o. I may choose the same t o here. I'll tell you in a minute why, to the power of t. So it's t over t o. Uh, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? I, d I don't understand. Uh, just just uh, acoustically, <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> OK, but I think by way of exception, what I've written is correct. <laughs> So, and uh, the C of t is another integration constant, let's call it r over t, and then the z is t over t o to the r. So let me write the metric, and then, then we discuss if it's really possible to choose for here always the same t o. So uh, then the metric is G, what was the metric? It began with minus c squared dt squared. And then we had a squared, uh, sorry, x squared, x squared, d little x squared, x squared, uh, this thing here squared. So it's t over to to the 2p. t over to to the 2p, the x squared. And here analogously to the 2q. dy squared plus t over t o to the 3r dz squared. And now you see why it is possible to choose always the same, uh, the same uh, cons uh, integration constant t o, because we can still rescale the x, the y, and the z with, with constant factors. We are still free to introduce, uh, to multiply them with a constant factor. This wouldn't spoil our orthogonality, which we have assumed. Yeah? We haven't fixed the length in any way until now. So if we have different integration constants here, we could just pull an appropriate factor inside the, uh, the coordinate differential, and then we get it with the same factor. So this was no restriction. But the p, the q, and the r, of course, they are different. And they are not independent, because we have uh, certain conditions on the theta. So, p, so at first we would say, aha, we have found a three-parameter family of solutions. Yeah, it depends on where well, this is a kind of, 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 of unit, unit for the time coordinate. Uh, this is rather irrelevant. So the P, the Q, and the R, these are the relevant uh, parameters. So we would say there are three parameters. We have found a three-parameter vacuum solution. But all, actually, it is only a one-parameter uh, family, uh, a one-parameter family, uh, a one-parameter uh, 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 solution. It depends only on one parameter. Why is that? Because P, Q, and R are not independent. What are the conditions? P, Q, R are related by two conditions. The first, conditions is, the first condition is that theta was 1 over t. Yeah? Theta was 1 over t. It's still written here. Theta is 1 over t. This means that A plus B plus C is 1 over t. And A plus B plus C is P plus Q plus R over T. P plus Q plus R over T is 1 over T. So you see the sum of the three parameters must be 1. That's our first condition. And then we have the condition on the squares. We have, it's written down there, theta squared. Whoops. Theta squared is a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So we have theta squared is a squared plus b squared plus c squared. What is this? Theta squared is 1 over t squared. And this is, well, a is p, uh, a is p over t, this is q over t, this is r over t. So I get p squared plus q squared plus r squared over t squared. So also the sum of the squares must be equal to 1. This is the second condition. OK, and that's what this vacuum solution, which we have found here, is the Kastner solution. It's called, it's named after, 
It's a vacuum solution, a vacuum solution of uh, Einstein's field equation. It was found already in the year 1921 by this gentleman, Edward Kastner, American mathematician. Have you heard this name before, the name Kastner? It is, it is frequently mentioned in connection with something completely different, namely with a, um, with a search, uh, search engine Google. You know where the name Google comes from? Why, why they call the search engine Google? Exactly. And who invented this word Google for this big number? Edward Kastner. <laughs> the story is uh, he, he was uh, talking to his little nephew who was, I don't know, nine or ten years old. And he told him about very big numbers. So he said to his nephew, imagine a one with hundred zeros. That's an enormously big number. How would he call such a number? And the little guy said, I would call it a Google. Don't ask me how he came about this word, but that's what he suggested. And actually, Kastner used this word then for this, this number. And he, he continued and he said, and now, con now consider a one with a Google of zeros. Yeah? With this enormous high number of zeros. And then he, he calculated on a sheet of paper uh, what, uh, how, how, how much space one would need in order to write. And this is what he called a Googleplex. Yeah, this number where you have a one and then a Google of zeros. That's a Googleplex. So how long would this number be? And he calculated when, you, when one writes it, uh, say with, with one, one centimeter for each digit or so, that then the space from here to Sirius wouldn't be enough in order to write down this number. <laughs> So these are these words, Google. Uh, actually, the spelling originally was, was this here. That's how Kastner spelled it. Yeah? And the search engine, they, they, uh, of course, they are now spe uh, spelling it in this way. Don't ask me why. But they are referring to, uh, referring to this, this, word, this word Google. So that's what uh, where the name Kastner is probably now most frequently mentioned for. But among other things, he also he found uh, a solution to Einstein's vacuum field equation. And it's this solution. It is this one parameter family of solutions. Yeah? So we have the P, the Q, and the R here, but they are related by these two conditions, which are called the Kastner conditions. And uh, well, we can geomet, uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, 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 we can uh, talk about how to, uh, what, what these conditions mean geometrically. So if you have three axes, uh, probably I won't be able to, uh, to draw this properly. We have P, Q, and R. So, well, this, this second condition is easy. What is this geometrically in a PQR diagram? P squared plus Q squared plus R squared equal to one. That's a sphere, of course, I already see. <laughs> so that's, that's just the unit sphere, right? And now what is this here, <laughs> geometrically? I learned this in school in, I don't know, in the 10th grade or so. Uh, uh, we, we did this for, oh, for weeks and weeks, really. This is a Hesse form of, uh, of a plane. It's a Hesse form of a plane. Have you seen this? So it's an equation of the form. If my position vector is x, this now corresponds to the three components pqr. And you multiply it with a normal vector, that then you have a certain, a certain constant here. Yeah. This is the equation for a plane. And that's exactly this form here. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is, what is it? It is 1, 1, 1. Yeah, it is 1, 1, 1. This is PQR, and this is one. So it's a Hesse form of a plane, so we cut our sphere with a plane. I, I think I'm not be able, I will not be able to, to draw this properly. The plane must go through these three points, yeah? Because obviously, if two of these numbers are zero and one is one, then the equations are satisfied. So, uh, yeah, cut with this, with this triangle. Uh, no, it's not good. No, no, I, with, a, with a plane spanned by this triangle. And then you get, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I, <laughs> I try to produce a nice picture with Mathematica. So I cut with this plane. And so I, what, what do I get? If I cut a, a sphere with a plane, what do I get? A circle, very good. <laughs> we get a circle, yeah. So it's a circle which passes through these three points. And that's what one calls the Kastner circle. So these two conditions together, they fix a circle in three space. A circle is something one dimensional, so it's really only a one parameter, a one parameter thing. And, uh, oh, let me see. Uh, so now the question is, uh, what's the behavior of, these, uh, of this metric? Well, obviously something, 
Uh, the, the question is when t becomes zero, yeah, we have fixed the integration constant such that uh, something bad happens at t equals zero. If t is equal to zero, then this, uh, the theta becomes uh, infinite. So at t equals zero, something goes wrong. And now it depends on the sign of these exponents. Yeah? If they are positive, then this means that at t equals zero, uh, we, have, uh, we have a big bang, at least in this particular direction. We have to discuss it for each spatial direction separately. But if the, uh, if the coefficient is negative, then it means that we get a stretching in this direction. Yeah, then we get 1 over 0, which is infinite yeah? At, uh, for, uh, for, for t equal to 0. So we have to discuss the signs of these coefficients. Well, you, if, you <laughs> if you have a certain geometric imagination, you could discuss this with the help of a picture. But uh, I, I prefer to do, it <laughs> to do it algebraically. So we have a couple of cases. The first case is, uh, well, uh, let's begin in a very stupid way. Let's try if it is possible to have all three of them equal to zero. And of course, it does not work. Yeah? You see, neither of these equations is satisfied. So this is impossible. So at least, at least one of them must be different from zero. So let's say only q and r are equal to zero, but p is different. q equal r equals zero. What do we get? If q and r are equal to 0, this requires p equal 1. And this is compatible with p equal 1. So in fact, it works. It works. So we must then have p equal 1. This would be this point on the, uh, on the Kastner circle, right? So p is equal to 1, and the other two coordinates are equal to 0. But what is the metric then? Let's look at the metric. Then the metric is g is minus c squared dt squared plus t to the L over to squared dx squared. And the other coefficients are something to the power 0. This is just 1. Plus dy squared plus dz squared. You know this metric? Has anybody seen it before? It's just Minkowski space in disguise. <laughs> and you see this if you do the following coordinate transformation. It's a so-called uh, Rindler, Rindler wedge, or yeah, Rindler coordinate system for Minkowski space time. So if you introduce with the coordinate transformation, say t tilde, is I have to look up the, the coefficients. Uh, this is t times cosh x over c t o. t o is this integration constant here. And an x tilde, which is uh, with a c, right? Yes, for dimensional reasons, I must have a c in front of it, times the sinh of this expression. And well, if you calculate the differentials, then you will find that g is just minus c squared d tilde squared plus the x tilde squared plus dy squared. We don't do anything with these terms. Plus dz squared. So it is Minkowski space time. Yeah? It's Minkowski space time. And again, that's something which we are not interested in. And uh, well, these coordinates, or original coordinates, the coordinates without the tilde, they don't cover the, all, the whole, uh, the entire Minkowski space time. They cover what is called the Rindler wedge. So if we have uh, x here, ct here, our original coordinate, uh, no, sorry, the, the, the ones with the tilde, the ones with the tilde. Then we have our, uh, uh, our representation in the coordinates without the tilde. We have only in this so-called Rindler wedge. These are the surfaces t equal constant, and these are the world lines x equal, uh, x equal constant. And uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing happens in the y and the z direction. So the whole thing is translational invariant in the y and the z direction. So this is just Minkowski space time in, um, in uh, Rinder coordinates. Are the dotted lines supposed to be at 45 degrees? Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> so we are inside the, the, the light cone. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so then let's see 
So we have the case all three equals zero, then one equals, uh, then uh, two equals zero, now comes one equals zero. So if we have, uh, say, P and Q different from zero, I can write it in this way. Yeah, this means both are different from zero. And R is equal to zero. Let's see, what do we get then? How do I do this? Let me check this. I've forgotten it. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, oh, yes. I, uh, right, right. I uh, compare this equation with this equation squared. So I get, um, so I get uh, P plus Q is equal to 1. And then it's also equal to 1 if I square it. And on the other hand, we have uh, p squared plus q squared equal to 1. These two conditions have to hold, yeah? r is equal to 0. So I take this condition and square it. And I just write down this equation. And now I subtract these two things. And then I get 2pq must be 0. And I get my contradiction. Okay, I had assumed that p and t times p times q is different from zero, but I get from these two conditions that they must be zero, so it doesn't work with this. So one first case doesn't work, second case is boring, third case doesn't work, so hopefully the fourth case will give something interesting, and actually it will give something interesting. So that's what one actually calls the Kastner solutions, only the fourth case when all four of them are different from zero. So, oops. So the fourth case is P, Q, and R all different from zero. That's what I mean. Let me just write it in this way. So now we have, to, we have uh, two possibilities, right? The two possibilities are two are positive, and the, other, the third one is negative. Or two are negative, and the third one are positive. The question is, are both cases possible? And of course, it's impossible that all three have different signs. Yeah, two of them must coincide, because I have only two possibilities for the sign. So let's see. Actually, I claim that only the case that two are positive and one is negative, that only this case is possible. Let me try to prove this, and then we are done for today. I've run a little bit over time, but uh, I hope that's not too bad. So let's assume. So we may assume without loss of generality, We assume that P and Q have the same sign. So P, Q is different from zero. Yeah? Two of them must have the same sign. Yeah? So let's say P and Q have the same sign. Then R must have the different as uh, the other sign. And the question is, is R positive or is it negative? And uh, well, I have then, then two expressions for R squared. The first expression is R squared is 1 minus P minus Q squared. Yeah, that's the first uh, Kastner relation, because R plus, uh, P plus Q plus R is 1. And the other is R squared is 1 minus P squared minus Q squared. OK, let me multiply this here out. I get 1 plus P squared plus Q squared minus 2P minus 2Q plus 2PQ. OK, and let's take the difference of the two things. And I get 0 is 1 minus 1. p squared minus minus p squared gives 2p squared. q squared minus minus q squared gives 2 times this. And the other ones I just copy. Minus 2p minus 2q plus 2pq. OK, I can divide by 2. And I take these two terms to the other side, and I get p plus q is p squared plus q squared plus 2pq. But these terms are all positive. Yeah? They are all positive. This is a square of something which is non-zero, so it must be bigger than 0. Same for this here. And we have assumed that p and q have the same sign, so this is also bigger than 0, bigger than 0. This means P and Q have the same sign, so if the sum is positive, P and Q must be positive. Yeah? So this means P bigger than 0, Q bigger than 0, and then of course R must be negative, because uh, the sum of them um, 
uh, because they cannot have all the same all the same sign, right? We have just uh, 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 wait a minute. Have I proven this? Let me see. Uh, what is the case that they have all the same sign? Have I proven this? <laughs> that this is impossible? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I think I forgot this. I think I forgot this. Uh, uh, ah, wait a minute, it's obvious from the Kassner relations. Look, from this relation, yeah? If all three have the same, uh, from, from the two things together, actually, if all have the same signs, then we see that 2PQ plus 2PR plus 2QR, that this uh, would have to be zero. And if all of them are, are positive, this cannot be zero, right? So it's actually it's the same calculation which we have done, uh, which we have done here. Uh, okay, let me do it. Uh, let me do it. Uh, I should have done this before before this here. So let me squeeze this here in, into this. So assume assume Q PQR has the same sign. So then we have what? We have uh, 1 is P plus Q plus R squared. And we have 1 is P, plus P squared plus Q squared plus R squared. And now let's subtract this. I get 0. The square terms drop out. So only the mixed terms survive. 2PQ plus 2QR plus 2RP is the only thing that survives. But now if you assume that all have the same signs, then all these three terms have the same signs. So how can, can they give zero if they are non-zero? Yeah? So we have a contradiction. Sorry, I forgot this. <laughs> I, I thought I, I'm getting senile. So I thought I had done this already, but I, I forgot to do this. So I should have done this here before I, before I state this here. And now we have, but now the proof is complete, right? So that's, uh, that's the upshot. These Kastner solutions must have two positive and one negative, uh, one negative exponent. And this means the following. This means the following. Where's the metric? Oops. This means the following. Oops. Here. Uh, here's the metric. Here's the metric. You see? So if you go to t equals 0, you come from the future, you go into the past, then you reach t equals 0. So let's assume p and q are positive. This means in this direction, in the x and the y direction, we have the same behavior as we know it from the Robertson-Walker space, and we have a big bang. It goes to zero. Yeah? But here, the t is in the, in the denominator because r is negative. This means in this direction we have a stretching. So that's what we call a cigar singularity. Yeah? So all the vacuums, uh, if we exclude the trivial, the Minkowski case, then all the um, all the Kastner solutions have what is called a cigar singularity. A singularity. Yeah? Stretching in two directions, but uh, sorry, uh, shrinking in two directions, collapsing in two directions if we go backwards in time, and stretching in the other direction. So we don't have a point singularity, we have an, yeah, an infinitely long string singularity, so to speak. So that's an infinitely long cigar. Yeah, that's what this, <laughs> this, name, <laughs> this name refers to. OK, sorry, I'm already long over time. So this, this was a vacuum case. On Tuesday, we will do the dust case. And we will then see uh, in which way the, the vacuum solutions, the Kastner solutions, actually serve as limit cases for the, for the, uh, for the dust solution. OK, any questions? Or, then have a nice weekend.